Thank you for being a part of our audience today. Our study today on the necessity of baptism and that churches of Christ are known for teaching and talking about the necessity of baptism comes to the forefront when one studies certain passages of scripture in his New Testament. The one I wanna look at today with you and then look at several reasons that back up this teaching is found in 1 Peter chapter three, and we wanna look at verse 20 and 21. After we read this passage, I will also show you others who have sought out what's in this passage of scripture and exactly how they found it as is taught in this passage of scripture. So let's get 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 in front of us. Here you'll have the apostle Peter writing and he says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those two verses will serve as the basic text for our study today. So with these before us, let's take a look at what they teach. He makes a comparison between the ark in Noah's day and baptism, and he connects the two together with the idea of salvation. Just as people were saved in Noah's ark, people are saved by baptism. Also, you will observe the comparative number. Few were saved in Noah's day. We know the number few there means eight souls. That would be Noah and his wife and their sons and their wives. Eight souls were saved by water. Few were saved. When you think about the subject of baptism, it must be something for us to really focus in on and concentrate on. We cannot take it lightly because it is connected with salvation and we would find ourselves guilty of committing the same oversight that the people in Noah's day did when they didn't pay attention to him being a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2, 5. And as he urged them to repent in the book of Genesis chapter six, verse five and following. So this subject of baptism is really important and apparently not many people are gonna pay much attention to it. I know there's a nationally known speaker, a lady came to church services this, this past Sunday night and said she was listening to him and he said, baptism's not important, love is what is important. Well, if baptism isn't important, why does the Bible talk about it? And what you'll have is somebody who's wanting to do what he wants instead of what God wants. So be very careful on the subject of baptism. It is a watershed issue. It is a key issue in an understanding of the matter of salvation. So in talking about Noah, he says eight souls were saved by water. He says the like figure, that is the figure corresponding to that. Even baptism doth also now save us. The distractors of this passage will sometimes say, well, in Noah's day, they were saved by staying out of the water. Now they won't finish the sentence because they wanna let you do it. They wanna say that in Noah's day, they were saved by staying out of the water in the ark. And they want you to draw the conclusion that you should stay out of the water today. Bear in mind that even our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 3, 17 was baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. And also you might wanna keep in mind that an evil spirit, when he's cast out of a man, likes to walk through dry places. That's what the New Testament teaches. So if somebody is implying that baptism isn't necessary or you don't need to get into the water, he's saying just the opposite of what the New Testament teaches in that regard. So you make them finish the sentence when they try to tell you that and just have them say to you that they don't think you need to be baptized and you need to stay out of the water and then return to this passage and say, why did Peter say, baptism doth also now save us? Another way that the detractors like to say that this means that baptism isn't necessary is by saying, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. And what they're saying is the filth of the flesh is sin there when it is not. The filth of the flesh is the filth of the flesh, dirt on the body. And they wish to make it metaphorical and say it has nothing, nothing to do with sin. When they say that, they made the apostle Peter contradict himself. He said baptism saves and they turn around and say that it doesn't save you from sin. That's not what this passage is teaching. It's teaching it's not a mere washing in water, but it is the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now also I want you to notice that it was the water that made the difference in Noah's day and in ours. 
They were saved by water in Noah's day because the water separated them from a wicked world. All of the wicked people on the face of the earth died in the flood in Noah's day. Today, the water of baptism separates a sinner from the world. By being baptized, he now becomes a saint. Whereas he was lost, now he is found. Whereas he was a sinner, now he is saved. Whereas he was a servant of himself, he's now a servant of Jesus Christ. The water of baptism is that separation today, just like it was in the days of Noah. So you want to keep that in mind as you look at these verses. Now, I'd like for us to look a little closer at this passage and do a word study in English. And to do that, it will be necessary for us to look at two translations of the New Testament. And I'll be using the King James Version of the Bible of 1611 and the American Standard Version of the Bible from 1901. Now, these are really strong literal translations of the original Hebrew and Greek. You know, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, all except for the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 7, verse 28, which are written in a form of Hebrew known as Aramaic. All of the rest is written in Hebrew. And the New Testament is written entirely in Koine or common Greek, except for the Aramaic words that are found interspersed, especially during the personal ministry of Jesus because he spoke Aramaic. And so the New Testament, we say, is written in Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew because that's largely the case. Now then, these Greek words from which these English words are taken here will not be the subject of our study today. While everyone has access to great tools to be able to look behind the text at the original language, not everyone has that available, so we'll stay with the two English texts. There were 47 translators of the King James Version of the Bible. There were 101 translators of the translation known as the American Standard Version of 1901. These men were translating the Bible at the pinnacle of their educational attainments and at a time when a search for Bible truth and accuracy concerning Bible text was really keen. Now, it's not so much so today, but it was in 1611 and in 1901. That's not to say that everyone who's translating the Bible is off the mark, but it is to say that that was an era of time where a great deal of respect was shown to the inspired Word of God, much unlike our day, where we are very challenged by people who are critical of God and the things of God in our particular time period. So anyway, these are considered to be accurate translations of the original languages. That's why I'm making the point. To do that, let me notice with you the English words that appear here for us in 1 Peter 3, at verse 21. Peter said, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The word study I'd like to focus in on with you is the word answer. Because in the King James Bible, baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. And it certainly looks like when you read that, that a person whose conscience is troubled because he's lost now finds an answer to a good conscience by being baptized. I believe that's an accurate presentation. Also to compare that with the American Standard Version, the American Standard Version, instead of the word answer, has an interrogation of a good conscience. And in a footnote, it says an inquiry. So what do we have there? We have a conscience that is looking to be good, a good conscience. That is a conscience of a person that is aware of the fact that he or she is a sinner in the sight of God. And an inquiry is being made. An interrogation is being made as to how to find favor with God and how to find the forgiveness of my sins that separate me from God. Now, the original word from which these two words, interrogation and inquiry and answer, come, when looking at that word in itself in a dictionary, like, for example, Joseph Henry Thayer's dictionary or others like Art and Gingrich or many others, what you'll find in regard to that word is that it means an inquiry that is seeking an answer. So you have a lost person who is trying to find out what to do to be saved. And that's all in that one Greek word that is translated an interrogation or an inquiry that finds an answer. 
Now, the reason that it may be difficult for us to see these two points of view from these reliable translations, both of them saying the same thing, is because this word is an involved word, and the translators of these translations are not doing like those in later years who are taking liberties with the text and putting in what they think the meaning is. They just allow the reader to grapple with an understanding of the meaning himself and give, as close as they can, a one-word or brief word translation of the original for those who do not have the capacity to do that. So what do you have? You have a person who has an inquiry. What can I do to be saved? What can I do? I'm, I'm in, having an interrogation going on about my sins here, and my conscience is bothering me about that because I know that God's a holy God. I've heard about heaven and hell. I want to do something about it. I find an answer in baptism, the answer of a good conscience toward God. It comes in baptism. Now, friends, that's one of the reasons why churches of Christ are known for teaching the necessity of baptism because people want to be saved and they want to know that they're in a right relationship with God. And when they've obeyed the gospel by hearing and believing it, that's how faith comes, Romans 10, 17, by repenting of all past sins, as Acts 2.38 and Romans 2.4 teaches us, and by confessing their faith in Christ, as Romans 10.9 and 10 say to do, then when they are baptized, they have found the answer of the interrogation of how to have a good conscience before God. I think it's a marvelous verse of Scripture, and the more we explore it, the more we respect and appreciate it. Now, in the remainder of time that we have, let me give you some examples that will make this discussion, I think, even more meaningful. I like to think about giving a definition and then seeing an example, like when a person's in a math class and you understand a formula and you see the formula that is set out before you and it looks a little difficult, but you go through it, okay, I think I've got it. Now to make sure it works, you have examples. The teacher will give you examples of how this formula works and the next thing you know, the formula becomes even more clear. Well, let me give you some examples from the perfect place to get them, and that would be in the book of Acts. And the reason I say that is because in the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a book that is about the establishment and the expansion of the Church of Christ. And in thinking about the establishment and expansion of the Church of Christ, we have a number of times that we find people who were in a lost state at first, and now then, before we leave them, they're in a saved state. And Luke, through his pen of inspiration, will tell us what they did to move from point A to point B, from being lost to being saved. Sometimes there will be generalities, like the number of the disciples was multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, Acts 6 at verse 7. Or we'll read about the number of the believers was increased, Acts 5 verse 4. And there's not a lot of details given about that. We just know it's increasing, but how? Luke focuses in, on an analysis of the book of Acts will show you 10 case studies where he will take a situation, he will show you people that are sinners at the first, they will all hear the gospel being preached, and then they will respond to that gospel and they're taught how to respond to the gospel of Christ in these case studies. Now let me say as we approach these that not every detail is repeated in every one of these case studies but it is therefore our responsibility to take a look what is said overall, combining the whole. And we know that we can do this and should do this because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 17 that he taught the same thing everywhere in all the churches. So while not everything in its detail may be recorded, we may safely conclude that each person, each place, or each group of people in each place did the same thing to be saved. No variations or differences. In fact, when Paul is talking about the conversion of the Jews and the conversion of the Gentiles, he will say that God put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, Acts 15, 7. So let's take a look at a few of these as time affords us opportunity. The first example that I want to give of people who are making an inquiry for a good conscience and are finding that answer in baptism is in Acts chapter 2. Now let's look at Acts chapter 2. What you have right here are the people who 50 days earlier had been crying out, crucify him, crucify him in regard to Jesus. These people are now hearing the gospel preached in its fullness for the first time. 
The apostle Peter is telling them how that Christ died according to the Old Testament scriptures. And he's saying that you are the ones who are responsible for his death. Imagine the courage it would take to tell men the truth, even though it imperiled your own life, Surely your love for the hearts and minds of other men and women for whom Jesus died would be caught up in telling the truth about what they need to do in order to have that good conscience they seek. When Peter's discussing that, he tells them, you by wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. That's a very hard statement and I submit that there's probably not been a harder statement made against anyone than that statement right there. They were guilty of the crucifixion of the Son of God. But in verse 36, Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now watch what happens. And we're looking at the conscience. Remember, we have seen that baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God, the inquiry of a good conscience toward God, for that conscience to be clear. When Peter told them that, Verse 37, Luke records of Acts 2. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. That means they were cut to the heart. You see, their conscience has been impaled upon that statement of the apostle Peter that they were guilty of crucifying Jesus Christ. And they said, they spoke out. They said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, these people are clearly making an interrogation, an inquiry for a good conscience when they ask that question, what shall we do? They didn't know what to do. It's not a matter that their salvation would just come on them automatically or that intuitively they would know what to do. They did not know what to do. They're seeking a good conscience and they're going to find it in the next statement that Peter gives in Acts 2 verse 38. Luke wrote, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What do I need to do to have a clear conscience? What do we need to do? We need to repent and be baptized. That's why Peter would write later, the same Peter would write later in the passage that provides our basic text for our study today, the light figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Watch as that principle finds further expression in the example in Acts 2 with the Jews on the day of Pentecost in AD 33. The Bible says in verse 41, then they that glad to receive their word were baptized. They were glad to receive that word because it gave them a clear and a good conscience. How did they respond? They were baptized. Now, I'm sorry for the nationally known denominational preacher who was preaching this past Sunday night who told people, don't worry about baptism. That's not what Peter said, is it? Peter didn't say, well, you know, the love of God is what's most important. He didn't say that because what they needed is a clear conscience they knew they needed to do something in response to their bad actions, their sinful actions, and in order to receive favor with God. When Peter told them to repent and be baptized, they gladly received his word and were baptized. You know, one of the most baffling things to me today as a preacher and thinking about matters religious and all the churches is why in the world does any man today want to teach something that is contradictory to what the inspired word of God teaches like John Hagee taught on TV Sunday night. What motivates someone like that? Why not just teach what the Bible says about it so that people can have a clear conscience? Does the preacher not want men and women to have a clear conscience? Is that why they persistently fill up the building where he preaches and where others like him preach is because they're seeking a clear conscience but they won't be clear and precise as I'm being right now in a few short sentences and in a few short min minutes, like Peter did on the day of Pentecost to tell us exactly what to do to have a clear conscience. I think that's an element of it, brethren and friends. I think those people continue to pray upon their audiences because they know they have some good-hearted people who wanna do right, 
but they're not going to tell them what is right because they want their conscience to still be upset to keep that inquiry going. So they come back time again and time and time and time again, never satisfied that they've ever obeyed God and received forgiveness of their sins because they can't put their finger on the moment they were saved. But when you listen to what Peter said, these people were glad to receive his word and the same day they were added unto him about 3,000 souls. And then in verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts 2.47. So there's you an example of people who are seeking a good conscience, and they are finding that good conscience in response to the words of the inspired Apostle Peter. Let's look at another one. Let's go to the 8th chapter. Let's stay in Acts now. Remember the theme of the book. And let's go to Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we find a man who's a worshipful individual. He's certainly diligent because he had traveled from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship God. He's a conscientious and responsible person because he's a treasurer under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship, but you know, he wasn't satisfied when he was there because on his return trip, he's riding along in his chariot and he's reading in the book of Isaiah. And he's reading that he was the servant of God, was led like a sheep before his shearers without speaking and that he would be a substitutionary sacrifice and he was baffled at what he read. The Spirit of God had sent Peter to meet him on the Gaza Strip. And uh, that is when Philip appears running alongside this man's chariot as he's reading his Bible out of Isaiah 53, as confused as he could possibly be. And Philip asked the premier question for the moment. He said, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch is an honest man. He said, how can I except some man should guide me? Philip joined him in that chariot. And the Bible says that Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Oh, that's the answer to Isaiah 53. The suffering servant is none other than the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And as he preached unto him Jesus, the next verse says, as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip must have been talking to him about various aspects of the life and teaching of Christ, including the one where Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. So it is the eunuch who said, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? He wanted to be baptized immediately. Why? Because he had a conscience that was making that interrogation, that inquiry, seeking an answer in order that he might have a good conscience. The next verse says, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Upon that confession, we read in verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The eunuch found the answer of that good conscience he was seeking. When Philip came alongside and taught him about Jesus and taught him the place of baptism and God's plan of salvation. When we leave that passage, we find that when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Why was he rejoicing? Because he found that answer that 1 Peter 3.21 says occurs in baptism. There are many other cases. I was hoping we'd have time to study the case study of Cornelius, who was a devout man and feared God and gave much homage to the people always, who heard Peter when he came and preached to him. And then You'll notice that centurion is there and he wants to hear all things commanded thee of God. And verse 48 says, Peter commanded him to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That centurion was seeking a good conscience and Peter gave him the answer. And that answer was baptism. I wanted to talk to you about Lydia in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, verses really 14 and 15 where she was customarily praying on the Sabbath day along with her friends in her household. And uh, Peter, rather Paul, makes his way to her and uh, teaches her the gospel. And uh, 
Her heart is open as she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul, and she was baptized. And she tells him, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained them. She was seeking that good, clear conscience. And Paul told her exactly what to do to have a good, clear conscience. And she was baptized. Friends, churches of Christ are known for teaching the necessity of baptism because we have a responsibility from the Lord to teach men and women to believe and be baptized. Mark 16 at verse 16, in order to be saved. And the apostle Peter told us, the light figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope this study today and these verses have been helpful to bring that understanding about and to deepen that understanding in our hearts and minds for those of us who already appreciate it. I want to thank you for your time. It's been my privilege to be with you. My name is Gary McDade, and I'm the preacher for the Tiftonia Church of Christ, and I want to invite you back for any other episodes of the Everlasting Gospel.